everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Welcome to another week. Uh, so this is a bigger week in the board game world in the sense that the Spiel des Jahres nominees were announced early this morning. It wasn't early this morning in Germany, but it is here. Um, and so we'll talk more about that on Thursday. By the way, if you're watching this and you say Board Game Breakfast on Thursday, that's right. Every Thursday we do a Board Game Breakfast with Mr. Bonnick or me and Z. And we talk about all kinds of things, including the news. And then we even cut that news segment out and put it in its own segment at a later point. So lots of stuff going on. Folks, we got a lot of cool things coming up. In fact, I'm excited because this week is the first week in a while, well, in a long while, where we're doing a top 10 list live in the studio. Ha, it's been a while. And we're doing our top 10 years of gaming. Where do you think 2020 will lie? <laughs> Anyhow, um, so come back for that, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit anyway, but I'm just excited. So, anywho, we got a contest here. We got three. Oh, my mic is off? I took care of it. Got it. You're good. You're good. All right. So, anyhow, I'm back. Anyway, so we got a contest here, um, and this is for three copies of the game, face-to-face. -face. Um, th this is uh, for people in the USA, Canada, Australia. This is a really cool two-player game. I really like it. I just reviewed it last week if you want to learn about it. All you have to do to enter this contest is to email us at contest at dicetower.com, and in the subject line, put the game, as it shows here. Um, and in the question, put how many players can play the game face-to-face. -face. Um, just take a wild guess or look it up and find out for yourself. We'll pick some random winners to win. And let's keep going with some contributors, and we'll be right back. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University and the Dice Tower. So, Stella recently bought me this shirt. Why did you buy me this shirt? Because it's cheap. That's all? That's it. Hmm. See, I always thought it was... It is a complete accident, but I consider this my Nemo's War shirt. Uh, because it has the exact same colour palette as Nemo's War. <laughs> and this little action token from Nemo's War with the letter A on it, basically just goes right here. Holy moly! So, this is my Nemo's War shirt. <laughs> Like, I had no idea that Taryn's going to talk about this. So I was like, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Um, what did you get me this shirt? Well, because it's your birthday and it was like on special at, what was that, Big W? It's like Target came up and that sort of thing. And I didn't think of that. How, how do you like, how do you remember that? That's amazing. Mm, the <laughs> I, I just remembered the A and, and here we go. Oh my gosh. So this is officially Nemo's War shirt. Yes. So do you have anything, any t-shirt that resembles a board game? By accident. By accident. I was like, I, I didn't know you were going to talk about that. Anyways, <laughs> let us know, but I don't think that's going to happen very, oh, very often. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, so that's it, Taryn's, uh, Taryn's joke. Is this April's Fool? This is not April's Fool, isn't it? No, it's just... Yeah, okay, fine. Something um, I know. <laughs> and we are Mibble New Fair City on YouTube and on the Dice Tower. See you next time. Alright folks, each week I show some stuff that you can get at the Board Game Geek store. As I said, eventually we'll have many of our promos. Some of our promos are there now that you can pick up. So last week I showed some of these basically containers that you can put together. These are larger sized ones. So these can hold quite a few components. That's a lot of Ticket to Ride trains. That's more than come in the actual game. So they look good. These I like maybe better than the smaller ones. You can put them in a box. I still have a hard time sticking this in, but I don't know. The other thing that they have are game trays. So there are different types of game trays. They come in various colors. And so we have the three spot, a two spot, or two different two spots, and then one that's all by itself. Each one comes with a lid that snaps on them really snuggly. If you put these in your game, they're not coming apart. Now, I like these. I personally prefer the one that's just one. So when you're putting stuff in that, it's pretty easy. This one here, you can put like a piece in it. You might even be able to put a card leading in it. But the ones that have multiples, I find those a little too small for my fingers. 
But either way, these stack pretty easy outside. They have lids on them, and they did this in conjunction with game trays, which a lot of people like. Anyway, that's what's available on Board Game Geek. Let's keep moving. Hi everyone, how are you doing? It's Clara. So I'm talking about board games and I'm looking at digital versions and physical versions. And in this case, it's a game that I've played the digital version, but I have not played the physical version. And the game I'm talking about is Scythe. So Scythe is a beautiful looking game. It was sort of very much built off the artwork and it looks gorgeous. It's got these gorgeous minis. But I wasn't sure that I was going to like it. It's a really popular game. It does really well on Board Game Geek. But I don't know. It's It's got this Euro uh, stuff going on. So you're building an engine and you're you know managing resources, which I really like. But then it's got combat. It's got this sort of Ameritrash kind of combat thing. And I shy away from combat games. It's one thing if I'm doing a worker placement and I take a spot that my you know opponent wants. But if you build an area or you build an engine or something and your opponent wrecks it, I don't really like it. And it's the same, you know, if you're building an army. So I shied away from Scythe, even though it looked beautiful. But it was on sale on Steam recently. And so I thought, why not try it? And I'm so glad I did. So the combat side of it is such a small part. Now, I'm sure some people will play it where it's a bigger part. But the way I play it, it's not too big a part. And to be honest, it isn't devastating. It isn't the end of the world. It just sort of sets you back a little bit. So it turns out it's a really good uh, balance of that sort of combat, but Euro. And so, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And if I hadn't seen the uh, digital version, I probably wouldn't have ended up playing it, even though I like the look of it. Do I need the physical version? It is pretty. I think I could get away with the digital version, but if the opportunity came up, I think I would love to add it to my collection. So until next time, that's me. Uh, take care and bye. Hi, I'm Ambie, and today I'm going to talk about 46, a flip and write game where you're hiking the Adirondack Mountains. In 46, you're trying to get the most points by being the first to complete different goals, by visiting different mountain peaks, by hiking around them, and by visiting personal peaks by camping near them. There are three different path shapes that you can pick, and each turn you'll be picking one, drawing it on the board, and then camping in the corner spot where you end up. The path that you pick is also linked to a power or ability that you get when you pick that path, and those change each turn based on the cards that are drawn. Some of the powers give you extra points if you cross one of those items in the path that you draw, or some things give you water, which lets you increase the length of your path on future turns, and some things just give you extra bonus scoring. Each game, there are three different goals that are randomly chosen, and you get points if you're the first one to complete it, or on the same round of the first person to complete the goal. So in multiplayer, there's a race to try to get to those goals first. But in the solo mode, there's kind of an AI that completes the goals depending on which moves you take. So there's a puzzle in there because you know how fast the AI is completing each goal. Additionally, each game you're getting different personal peaks that you're trying to get to. So depending on what the goals in personal peak are, you're planning out your routes differently each game to get from the start to the end and visit all of your peaks. Overall, 46 is a fun route building game that's even more puzzly as a solo game. Bye! I was just trying to count how many Kirby's were there, but I think that's Kirby, right? Or is that a Pokemon? I'm pretty sure it's Kirby. Alrighty, well let's take a look here, folks, at what is coming out this coming week from the Dice Tower. So, um... We, at 10 o'clock today, Z is going to be playing Cartographers on the app live. I'll be doing a Q&A at noon, and uh, we got other reviews, lots of different reviews coming out over the course of the week. Um, tomorrow, um, I'll be going back to my five great games. We were going to do that last week, but things got delayed one week, so five great games where I take a look at more games that didn't make my top 100, but are amazing. Um, also, the top 10 best-selling games from April 2021. So we've been starting that series with Game Nerds, who sponsors the Dice Tower, and that way, I don't know, I just find that sort of thing fascinating. Sea of Legends! Um, Math Match, Cora, we'll be taking a look at Cloud Control. Um, the big review of the week, all four of us, or four of us anyway, will be taking a look at Destiny. 
Destinies. So we're excited to take a look at that. Uh, I'll be also doing Commands and Colors, Samurai Battles. Tim's going to be doing a How to Play of Kingless. And more stuff will show up. You'll see that. Um, another big thing that's happening is, I said we'd do it last week, but it's actually going up tomorrow. And that is the behind the scenes, how we moved from our last studio into this studio. When we remembered, because we were constantly moving, we took video of us moving. And then we would yell at the person taking the video to stop taking video and get to work. But anyway, we put all that together in one video, so you'll be able to see that tomorrow. Also, we reveal finally what was in the shed. Anyway, um, also, podcast going up. Uh, this coming... Uh, that's tomorrow. Tomorrow the podcast goes live. And if you missed it, me and Joe Stedman, we did, we listened to the original podcast, Dice Tower Episode 1, which came out in 2005. And we re-listened to that and gave our commentary on that. And we're going to be doing that every other week. Uh, we won't have another one go up this week, but hopefully next week. Anyway, let's keep moving. What is up? My name is Matthew McCack, and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love, and I connect it to a board game I love. And first I want to say that I know there's been some sort of confusion in terms of like, wait, I thought Matthew was her brother's name. No, my brother's name is Justin. I am non-binary. I go by both Matthew and Melissa. And with that out of the way, I want to talk about a video game called Wizards United, it is an app on your phone and it plays a lot like Pokemon Go if you're familiar with that. But essentially you're a wizard going around the world, literally walking around, and you have your phone out and you're discovering like new spells and everything and you're um, going to like different castles and things and taking out the big baddies and everything with, your, with the new spells that you've learned and there's potions and all that stuff, which is really cool. I want to connect that to... Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Now, one for the theme, right? Harry Potter, that's why I wanted to connect it, but also because I feel like Wizards United is pretty family friendly. And I think that Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is also a family friendly game. You're learning new spells as you go through the story because uh, there's seven different books and you actually go through all seven different books. Um, the story doesn't really seriously come through, I think, uh, in this game. It treats it like a, like a campaign game, but really it's just introducing new mechanisms. And I think it's great for introducing uh, people uh, like your kids, family members, non-gamers to the deck building mechanism. So I like it a lot. I think it's a lot of fun. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you could check out mine and my brother's channel called Room 51. I'll catch you next time. Hey there everyone, it's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages, I'm pushing some cubes with my segment from the page to the table where I pair books and board games together and we get a Netflix show. Sure. And yes, I'm still doing my laundry, folks, from last week. You know, if you follow me a long time here on Board Game Breakfast for over three years now, you know that... Uhtred, son of Uhtred, and I, we have a thing going on, and it's the books. This is Bernard Cornwell's third book in the series, following our, her our hero Uhtred in Lords of the North. So here we have an Uhtred who is down on his luck. It's uh, 870, 878, and you know, he has be he's been captured and is a slave um, for the Danes. So we have a really, tense story of how he is out of that situation and then kind of rises to his usual Uhtredness of, that he normally has. So what Viking game do I have left that I could pair with Uhtred, son of Uhtred? Well, that would be Reavers of Midgard. There's a lot to love in Reavers of Midgard. I might actually like it more than Champions. Uh, two to four players, 60 to 120 minutes, Vikings. Um, definitely the most complex Viking game um, of the two between that and Champions. The thing that I love in Reavers is that follow mechanic that is going on. We're not huge follow mechanic fans in our house. Sometimes they're over bloated and a little too complex than they need to be, but this is simple and easy. Um, 
and just mwah, I love it. That is all this week, friends. When is Last Kingdom coming back? Well, we'll see you next time. All right, I don't want to be too um, oppositional, but uh, Champs of Midgard is better than Reavers of Midgard. Both fun games, but just wanted to clarify that case. Uh, but they're both great, and they're both in the library. I know this because I just sorted them out. And as I'm going through the library, so this is what I'm doing, folks. Um, I've showed off the library. We have 25 shelves of games. Now, we at 26 if you include the expansions. 28 if you include the kids' games. But I'm not including any of that stuff. 20, no, there's a lot of games. I've moved the games around. I've shuffled the games and moved them to put them on the shelves that I want to be on. And now I'm going through each shelf one at a time, taking every game off the shelf, opening up the game, and messing with it. So there are several things I'm doing when I open up these games. I am seeing if there's solo stuff. I'm pulling that out, not because I think solo gaming is bad, but I think solo gaming at a convention is bad because I don't want you sitting there playing a solo game at a table when the whole point of coming to conventions is to play with other people. I'm taking out extra expansions and promo nonsense that was maybe good in my personal collection, but is not useful at a convention when you open up a box and it's like opening up something and the, everything blows out and you can't figure out what everything is. And I'm also fixing things up. I'm, I'm, make, I'm putting in better bags. I'm, a bit, I'm very much anti-tiny bags. Like, you know when you get a game and there's a bag for the two dice? And, or there's a, you know, not even that small, but just small little bags hold a few things. I hate them. So I'm getting rid of those and putting a nice four millimeter thickness bags. Four millimeter thickness is really good, holds stuff well. And also I'm using the Dice Tower containers. I have a whole box right here next to me of these containers. And there's five to a pop. And I'm just pulling these out and putting these in, they're amazing. I love these and I put them in all my games. Um, or at least most of the games, if the pieces fit in these, they're just fantastic. And so I have literally here next to me, this is 90 sets, there's five in a set, so I have 450 of them. And I got three more boxes in the garage where I'm just pulling through them. And I'm getting rid of the inserts of many of the games. Like almost every game, I'm getting rid of the insert. Now I've talked about inserts in the past, and there's a lot of people who love inserts, hate inserts. You know, there's different things that we talk about with inserts. But a lot of people get mad at Fantasy Flight, for example, for having what's called the trench insert. That's where it's a cardboard thing, and then down the middle, there's a bunch of pieces, and it's like, why do they have that insert? That insert's there for one reason. It's to hold the game together when it's being shipped when you buy it. Because that insert holds the board at the top, it, the stuff that's supposed to stay underneath the insert stays underneath it. It offers protection and keeps everything from bouncing around. I don't think they've ever designed it to for use of you putting the pieces in afterwards. And in fact, there's cost cutting because a plastic molded insert in a game adds quite a bit. Now, Fantasy Flight has done some plastic inserts in the past. Some companies have done it. Nowadays, lately, it's really taken a step up with companies adding all kinds of cool inserts to game, many of them with game trays and lids and things. I find inserts to be annoying most of the time. If the insert's a cardboard insert, I get rid of it. At best, it's holding the stuff together in a box a little bit, but I'm using the, our new Dice Tower box bands to hold our boxes together, and I put everything inside in plastic bags and plastic containers to keep it from bouncing around anyway. So I do that, so that part of the insert doesn't matter to me. Holding the pieces in is nice, but I found a lot of inserts can be confusing. Half the inserts I have, when I, I put the pieces in, I'm like, what pieces go where? And I particularly despise when there's a long row where like coins go and you have to put them in one at a time and or you pick them up in a stack and try to put them in without the stack breaking. Real pain in the neck. And a lot of plastic inserts I found to be problematic because I open up the game and everything is scattered all over the place. We, got, we gave, for example, last week we reviewed Red Rising with the deluxe version as an insert. And that insert, the stuff gets moved around at all if you carry the game. Even if you're carrying it horizontally, the stuff was coming out of that insert. If the insert has that problem at all, it's gone. Do I get rid of all inserts? No. If the insert has a lid, I definitely consider keeping those inserts. But I'm kind of done with inserts in many ways. I, if you'll, you'll notice on the channel 
that I am reviewing fewer inserts. There's a lot of good inserts out there. Rob Searing, our webmaster, has insert here.me um, and does a great job making inserts. And if you want one, I definitely recommend checking him out. And there's Broken Token and other places that make really good inserts. And I've reviewed them in the past, but I am just tired of them because I find them to be more work for me. And I am just on board with these containers, whether you're using these or earlier I showed you the ones um, from Board Game Geek. They just make my life so much easier. I open the game, I take out all the containers, put them on the table, pop them open, I'm done. I have a bag that has all the stuff for one person to play, including your starting money and everything else, your starting resources, and we're ready to go. And that to me is more interesting. So a pile of inserts is getting thrown out here. Some of them might be considered pretty good, but that's just where I'm at right now, especially with a library setting. But I think I would do this even on a personal level. So again, I'm not saying inserts are bad by any stretch of the imagination. I know some people love them. And of course, I think we can all agree that there are some inserts that are better than others. But unless it has a lid, which holds everything nicely in the box, a snap on lid too, by the way, a lid that just sits there is almost worse than having no lid at all. Um, or, by the way, I, don't get me started on giving me an insert but not telling me how to put all the pieces in because that's, you, you should actually possibly could serve some jail time for that. Just recently, what game was it? I got a game and I, I still don't know where everything went in the game. Chronicles of Dranagor. Chronicles of Dranagor, yes, thank you, Mike. We didn't know how to put everything in that game. And putting an update on your Kickstarter, update 32 out of 82 updates, is not where you show people how to put stuff in your insert. I'm getting really annoyed here. Mike, go to another contributor. Hey, what's up, Board Game Breakfast? It's me, Brian Drake, with a brand new mini-series series all about something adjacent to board gaming that is very near and dear to my heart. 3D printing. I mean, after all, who doesn't want to do this? Stroll up in your Walgreens like this, be like, hey, give me those protein bars right here. And you can do so much. This is FDM printing that we've got here, but we're also going to be doing resin printing. I mean, look, the whole family just turns into like just random Marvel characters and stuff. But when it comes to board game bits, you can print things like, this is a DC guy, but you can print small things like this. You can print board game bits. Heck, you can even dress your kids up as Marvel characters and, and wonderful stuff like that. Isn't that awesome? So... We're talking about board game bits, and what do we do with our board game bits is things like Grand Austria Hotel. We don't use cubes anymore, no, no. We have actual little resin printed cups of coffee and strudel, and little wine bottles and, and cake that we use, and we resin print those, which is a much neater, cleaner looking print. However, the downside is it's a gooey process. You take liquid and it freezes with light into these shapes. And so, I want to show you this machine that's really fantastic that does a really great job. This is the Mercury Plus by Elgu, and it keeps Everything's self-contained. It uses the alcohol in there, washes it, cleans it in this little bucket. You can strain it out of the bucket, put it right onto the thing that cures it. You have to use UV lighting to cure it. So a big fan of the Mercury Plus because what it does, it allows you to wash and clean. So back there is the alcohol solution that you use to clean it, and you put it in there and it'll take that spinner and whip it around. It comes with a basket here to put your figures in, or you can also have your figures attached straight off of the build plate there. You can take that build plate and attach it onto there, but you also cure it straight out here, which is very nice. We're going to take 30 seconds on this gambit, and we're going to cure it. And I've already cured it a little bit, but check that out. Those lights light up, and you get this wonderful cure of the figure. Because as we know, one of the most painful parts of resin printing is that you have to cure it as opposed to an FDM model over here where it just prints straight away. This allows you to cure and clean it much faster, which is nice than having to sit it out in the sun or trying to hopefully get it all in stuff. Like this keeps everything contained with the Mercury Plus. All this sounds crazy and you think, Brian, isn't 3D printing expensive? Well, no, not anymore. That's the beautiful thing. And as we do this series, we're going to be looking at some different machines and things like that that have really driven the cost down to where you can get a full 3D printer that can print all of this stuff right here for 160 bucks. And that's, at the end of the day, sounds expensive until you go, wait a minute, that's less than I paid for Marvel United. Half of it. So... I enjoy talking about 3D printing. We're going to be diving in how you can use it for board game inserts, for crazy things like this, for board game bits, all through this new series. Until next time, enjoy that breakfast. That seems like a lot of work, though. It does, I'm not so worried about the price, but it looked like he was, had a whole laboratory going on there.
We need, we need Brian to just 3D print stuff for us. All right. Today I want to talk and review a TV show that I saw on Amazon Prime called Invincible. Um, Invincible is based on an image comic that until this cartoon came out I had never read. Uh, I didn't know much about it. I saw the trailer, thought that looks interesting. My daughter and I like to watch uh, stuff like this. My daughter, by the way, is 17, um, and watching this. And I, and, I, and I mention that because Invincible is a mature cartoon, all right? This is not a cartoon I would let any young kid or even a young teenager watch. It's, uh, it's brutally violent. Um, tremendously violent. Now, there's a lot of violent TV shows. Uh, there's The Boys. There is the one that just came out, the uh, Omega uh, Mercury Project, Jupiter Rising, whatever, something like that. That stuff is, you know, there. But what makes this one, I think, more interesting to me is this takes the idea of Superman and turns it on its head. And I'm not going to say much more than that without spoiling it. If you watch this, you need to watch all the way to the end of episode one. You have to. Yeah, don't watch just half of episode one because the end of episode one, if you don't like it at the end of episode one, then you probably won't like the series. But the end of episode one, um, at that point you're going to realize because what the, the series definitely does kind of a turn on a dime and shows you what the rest of it's going to be like. Although the end of episode two is one of the best endings to an episode ever, I thought. Really, really good. Um, it is... A series, like I said, it's about superheroes, but it's very brutal. But what's really cool about this is almost all the characters in this are very interesting and many of them are very likable. One of the problems I have nowadays with a lot of TV shows is they show me a pile of characters and I hate them all. Like, I don't know why, who I'm rooting for. I don't like the good guys. I don't like the bad guys. In this one, I like all the good guys. There was even a couple bad guys who I didn't hate in this one. They were, they were very interesting. And then there's bad guys who might be good guys, good guys who might be bad guys. But the story doesn't cheat. It does a really good job of, you know, staying pace. The main character, Invincible, is in high school, and they show that. Like I said, there's a bit of language. There's definitely, you know, this much of violence in the series. But I thought it was really good story writing, and I would say this is this was more interesting to me than live action TV um, superhero stuff. I'm not a huge cartoon guy. I like cartoons, but I don't watch them that much. But this one I found to be really well done. Um, did I say the end of? Was I saying people should watch season one? I meant episode one. You should watch to the end of episode one. Um, the whole first season is available. It's on Amazon Prime, and I really recommend it. I'm really happy that they have a second and third season that's coming because I really want to see more, and they definitely set up for a season two. But if you ever watch a TV show and you say, man, I wish they would just move the series along. They're dragging it out. That does not happen here at all. They're, it just, they're, they don't pause for breath at all. And everything, even the quote-unquote episode of the week, moves the main plot along. And some of that episode of the week stuff will come back later on. So it's, it's really cool. Um, I like it better than most of the other superhero stuff I've seen this year. And uh, if you are an adult, I recommend it. And we are Our Fan Plays Games. <laughs> good morning, board game breakfast. It is yeah. so good to be back with the Dice Tower. All right, so what are we talking about? We are talking about three games that are fun and educational for your family. Sneaking that education on you. And yeah. the first one is Planet. By Blue Orange Games, two to four players where you're building your planet mm -hmm. from this cool little orb. Very unique game. Yes. Yeah. And all the different tiles are different terrains, and you stick them on the little sphere. Yeah. And you have different animals that live in those terrains. Awesome game for families. Teach you a lot. It, it teach does. you a lot. And the next one is Wingspan <sighs> by Stonemire Games. Yeah. One to five players. Learn about birds, y'all. Yes. Learn all about birds and where they live and what they do and what they eat. Yeah. yeah. What they eat. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And last but not least, World's Fair by Renegade Game Studios. 
two to four players. Learning all about the World's Fair back in the day, y'all. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so much history on the history. cards and what's going on, yes. what they exhibited there. Yes. It is so cool. Awesome yeah. games for family. Yeah. So if you've got families, especially families with kids or tweens, yes. these are some games you may want to add to your collection. Have fun, y'all. Have fun, and it's good to see you again. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. And that's it for another board game breakfast. Like I said, folks, a lot of stuff coming this week. Our live plays where we play through games, that's starting next week, so you have that to look forward to. We have, um, well, I'll just tell you, next is it next week? It is next week. We'll be playing uh, another playthrough of Return to Dark Tower. Um, but this week, a top 10 list is coming your way. Come back at 10 o'clock, which is only 30 minutes from now, to join Z as he plays through an app. I'll be back today at noon. Tomorrow we got live stuff. We got... Uh, five more great games. I'm doing that with Jen. And um, then after that, the shoots and marbles. It's so exciting. So much stuff. I'll see you next time. Don't forget the contest at the beginning of the episode. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.